but uh, whoops. Um, so I, we're just going to talk a little bit about sense making. And uh, again, if you want to follow me, um, Daniel Shaben, I'm at Arapahoe Public Schools where I teach. Uh, searching for math is my Twitter handle. And I also have some videos online uh, on YouTube's, pardon me. And I think you can also find me. I think both places, uh, and uh, you can find me um, uh, on both. I'm kind of in the middle of of teaching robotics. I've just become a passion and love of mine, and we'll talk about that a little bit here. But before we get going, let's uh, let's get rolling. And, and feel free. I've got my chat up, so if you need to talk to me, uh, please please ask a question. Any any way you can and uh and here we go and so we're gonna start this is how typically i'll start my classrooms is not necessarily an open middle problem uh, but i will start with uh with a bell ringer um, i try to only do open middle about once a week because uh, open middles will sometimes take up three quarters of the class period in discussion which is great but you don't get through much content then. So uh, I'm gonna give you a, a few minutes. I want you all to, we're gonna break you out into, a sesh, uh, into groups for about three minutes. You don't have much time. And I want you to uh, try this problem. So use the digits from zero to nine, at most one time each, place a digit in each box to make a true statement. Um, and I actually haven't thought about this problem. I have the answer somewhere, but uh, uh, go for it. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, break out quick. And uh, maybe we can just, uh, would you go ahead and break us out? Do I stop sharing? We are ready to go. So I'll open okay. those rooms. Okay. Got one right away, there at the very end. I didn't have one. I, I had actually just threw in numbers and did, was thinking six for some reason and did six to the negative second equals one over 36. And I don't think, well, that one I used six twice, so it didn't work. But Wendy came up with seven to the negative two equals one over 49 in our group. Uh, and I think that one works. Yeah. Yeah. So um chat let's see so there's one answer seven to the negative two over one over 49 did anybody come up with another one and let me go to chat because so maybe some of you can't yeah two to the negative third oh nice one over zero eight yeah yep one over eight to the negative second one over 64 um and while, while those answers are kind of coming in, um, I'm just going to share with you the document. I, I went ahead and just got on the open middle site. Just Google open middle if you like these problems. They are really great. And uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. And here it is. Let me share my screen with everybody again. Um, but I do have the answers. You guys probably have... Uh, uh, probably more than what they even came up with. Um, and that's what you find out too, is the kids, they're pretty crafty. Um, so, so these are the ones, oh yeah, yeah, there's that two to the negative third equals. So these are the ones that are for, the four possible answers uh, off of that. So, um, whoops, let me go back to my presentation. And so that, um, that's open middle. I, and I, like I say, I only use that about once a week. And I was telling my group uh, that, it, well, two things. I'm not very good at shutting my mouth. And the second thing is I'm, I, uh, I like to give problems that I don't know the answer to, especially at the beginning of the period. Uh, I like the challenge just like the kids do. And, and I, think, I think it helps out if, if uh, you're struggling along with the kids and, and uh, uh, you have a place to go get the answer, but it's nice for them to see that, you know, um, that how the learning process works. That's what I'm always after. Um, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll skip. I'm going to see if this plays. I don't, I don't know. So another part that I do, and I'm going to kind of flip through, kind of rush you a little bit here, but 
the another thing I do is I, I pick problems that are, let me go back to the chat. I pick problems that are um, also just anything I find locally. And so um, here is, um, oh yeah, thanks Lenny for posting that open middle um, that you collect, that, perfect. I'm looking at the chat too. But anyway, I, I've got problems. I, I took my site down because it started getting hacked by lots of people from other countries. And so I just kind of pulled everything down and I need to start sharing it again. But one problem that works really well, and I, I don't, I take my kids out once a year and just hand them compasses, very low tech and a map. And I drive them out into the country and I have them find, uh, find our location, like who can find our location uh, with just a compass and a map. And so uh, I don't, I don't even know and if Dan. If yeah, I, I do have this one up. Do you? If you want me to uh, share it with sound. Yeah, go ahead and share that one with sound. Okay. Let me stop sharing. All right. Uh, but I do, while she's loading that, uh, I do take the kids out and uh, in a bus because I'm the bus driver and, uh, and we, we do this one and it's, it's, they have a lot of fun with it. Go for right. it. That sound is not coming through. Yeah, that's Shoot. okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, go to go ahead and play it, and I'll just talk you through it. So, so what I I do this locally because Nebraska is great for this. I mean, you go to any go above any river, and you, you can pretty much uh, see three locations on a map, especially with our towers. But in this picture, you can see um, Scotts Bluff Monument and Chimney Rock. So Chimney Rock's kind of in the middle of the screen, Scotts Bluff Monument's further, but to the right. And then I, and then I pan the camera around to Jailhouse Rock and, uh, and then Bridgeport. But I'm just kind of showing, you know, how, how you can do this. You don't have to be in Western Nebraska. I think, uh, you know, if you get, get away from the trees, you know, somewhere it's Nebraska, we can find places without trees. Uh, you can, you can do this and it, uh, the kids really enjoy it, I think. And then there's a, it, this is just a kind of a fancy map. This is a Cheyenne sectional, um, which you can get online through Jepson, but uh, uh, you might even be able to get them for free if you just go to your local airport even your little guys like Arapaho, I just pulled this out of their airport and they said I could have it because I was on the airport board for a while. So that's a problem I do and I do several others. So you can go ahead and stop sharing and I'll pull mine back up. I should have just had you go to the next screen, but uh, uh, so that's, that's something what I, that I do. And uh, this going back and forth stuff isn't, uh, there we go. Whoops, see, I'm way too far ahead. But the, the link is there if you see that, that sectional map. It's just a little PDF. I just throw it on the copier and print it. But So I want another breakout room. Is there a math problem or experience you use in your classroom that is unique to you? So go ahead and break us out and talk about that. And when we get back, we'll share, share those. Fast, three minutes goes by fast. <laughs> uh, can it, can it people unmute and speak? Yes, we have that option selected. Okay, so I'm going to make this un informal. I'm going to mute mine right now. Um, in our group, uh, we had a couple, couple I, of course, I can't shut my mouth, but um, how one, one, one of my Mary said that she's uh, she does a accuracy problem with uh, with her calculator. Like once you round your answer, I mean, how accurate is that answer afterwards? And then uh, um, uh, Wendy said uh, um, she puts problems on the smart board, a whole bunch of them, and then lets lets the kids kind of work at their own pace while she's working them herself and kind of working through the classroom. 
Um, and of course I had too much commentary. So I'm muting now. Somebody I'm going to have Deb Bulin share her uh, uh, miniature golf one. Go, Deb. Okay, so I'm with Sandy Schneider, so you don't see me, but um, I have my geometry kids do a miniature golf project, and so they have to build a hole for miniature golf, and then they have to measure all the reflections and the angles to figure out the right path that it should take, and then they demonstrate it to us in class. They work in groups. And then in the last few years, we've been taking them over to the elementary um, and letting the kids just play with them. Like they get to play and they kind of see that. So I have kids now that had got to do that in elementary school. So now it's kind of building on that. You know, when do we get to do the golf project type thing? And they've really expanded over the years. I have people with PVC pipe ball returns and, you know, you still have some that aren't as good, but um, some of them do a really nice job. and. And uh, I think our elementary principal has used them at their carnival before. I asked some kids to keep it and use them at their carnival. So it's kind of a fun project that we do. Thank you. Open, open mic, who else? Great ideas. So this so reminds me of all of my remote teaching right now. You ask a question and it's crickets. Um, I, I shared that I sing, um, I do not have the greatest singing voice, but I have a couple of different songs that I use in some of my different units. There's, there's one, I, uh, there's a YouTube saw, a YouTube video called, um, circle, the circle song, or it's the circle two. Um, and, um, I, uh, I, it, it goes through all the parts of a circle with a real catchy tune. And then the chorus is pi r squared sounds like area to me. If I need the circumference, then I use pi d. And then, you know, and then it goes through the different parts. You know, this is a circle. It knows how to get, you know, anyway. Um, and the kids hate it. And the other teachers in my math department aren't very fond of it either. But when, um, when they come up to me or when they're having trouble with the formula or they can't remember it, I'll say, or, or I'll ask them, okay, so you need the area of the circle. How do you find the area of the circle? And they kind of look at me like, uh, and, and I'll say, do I need to sing the song? Do I need to make you, and, oh, oh no, it's pi r square. I mean, so it's just a really, it, it's a really good way to just hit another modality of their learning and remembering the concept. I have one that's called Sokotoa too. Sokotoa, 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 yeah, anyway. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, that's great. I, I do the uh, quadratic equation to pop goes the weasel. Uh, and the, uh, they, and I make them so, so one thing you can do is you sing it and then you force them to sing it. <laughs> you say, I'll sing in front of you, but you're going to have to, to, if I'm going to do this, you have to promise me you'll do it. Uh, I go so one, I go even go one step farther. I make them all stand. And we and I we sing it, and if they uh, the ones that actually sing it get to sit down, and they have to stand there until they actually sing it. We we've done the same thing, and we I take the, the class across the hall to the other algebra room, and they have to sing it for the other class. And I have an integer song that goes to row 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 your boat, and we do the same stand and sing, and we sing until everybody sings, and so sometimes it's two rounds through and sometimes it's 10 and sometimes we break out and do it in a round. So yeah, we make them all sing. Fabulous, fabulous. Yeah, I, I, I went from 0% of my kids remembering the quadratic formula to 100% just off of that song. And not, not that our goal is to get them to memorize everything, but uh, I always thought that was one worth memorizing. Song is great. Uh, yeah, who else? Anybody else have have a project? And then we'll move on. One more. I get to teach discrete math and stats again this year. Kind of a combination. I haven't been able to teach that for three years, so that's kind of fun. And we sing the mean song. And they, they liked it about as well as they liked the other songs. But they asked to sing it the day of the test. So 
it goes mean, the average mode, most often range, subtract the smallest from the largest. Anyway, they like that. And um, another activity that on a non-COVID year we'd do would be standard deviation with double stuff with Oreos. But we didn't get to do it this year, so maybe next year. Yeah, the yeah, the I, I love double stuff is great. And since they moved to Mexico, so I got to do the double stuff before when they're American made, and then a double stuff when they're they're all made in Mexico now. And so uh, now they are truly double stuff. Before they were not. So <laughs> I don't know if that was a, if that's true or not, but. Uh, th their company always says they're not double. They're called double S T U F or something like that. So it's not spelled. It's our name. It's not not actually meaning double. But yeah, that's a great project. Um, let me go back to my uh, let me go back to my presentation. I apologize for the uh, back and forth here, but I'm going to share because I do want to get through some of this other uh, content because I I feel very passionate about. Uh, ucube.org. I know a lot of you have seen their videos and I, I apologize for if you're having to watch it a whole bunch of times. Um, but, but these, but when I, they asked me to present, they said, you know, they, what are, what do you do that? I don't know. I, to me, it felt like I needed to, to, to tell you things that have changed my life and my education and how I teach and how I think about math. Uh, this is a video, uh, Number Sense by Joe Bowler, is a video that I think it completely changed my perception of mathematics, just this video. And so we'll watch it and uh, uh, let me stop sharing. Yep, and I have it figured out now, so. Okay, we'll sweet. do this. We'll do this right. Hi, my name is Joe Bowler and I'm a professor at Stanford. So what is number sense? Let's think about a problem. Let's think about 18 times 5. A student with number sense could solve this in many ways. For example, they might say, I know 20 times 5 is 100 and I know 2 times 5 is 10 and I'll take 10 away from 100, which gives me 90. We can visually represent that and visual connections are really important for our brain. So what would that look like if I drew 18 times 5 as a rectangle like this? We could represent 20 times 5 by saying it would be a slightly bigger rectangle and we'd subtract this blue part. Another way to think about 18 times 5 is to say it's actually equivalent to 9 times 10. And the visual representation of 9 times 10 is kind of interesting. If our 18 times 5 rectangle looks like this, then our 9 times 10 rectangle would look like this. And that 9 times 10 rectangle has the same area as the 18 times 5 rectangle. A third way I might solve this is to say, well, I know 9 times 5 is 45, and I can do that twice to give me my 18 times 5. And that visual um, would look like this. There's our 18 times 5 rectangle, and this time I worked out 9 times 5 and 9 times 5. And there we have those two rectangles. A fourth way to solve this is somebody might say that they want to break up the 18 to work out 10 times 5 and then 8 times 5 and add those solutions together. And the visual of that is if this is our 18 times 5 rectangle then we can find our 10 times 5 and 8 times 5 rectangles and they would look something like this. Another way, a fifth way of solving it is not to think of five 18s to, but to break that up and to think of two 18s of 36 and then we have another two 18s of 36 and add on a single 18 to give us 90. And that visual looks a little different to our others so it, if we have our 18 times 5 rectangle this time we've broken up the 5 into a 2, a 2 and a 1. So we've seen five different methods for 18 times 5. Can you find different ways of solving 12 times 9, both numerically and visually? Okay. Is, do you want me to keep that, going? No, no, no. That's perfect. Okay. That's perfect. That's perfect. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, so the reason I, I, I don't know, the reason I share this video is uh, I, I noticed after watching it, I noticed some of my kids were thinking this way if, uh, while I was in the middle of discussions. And a lot of times, a lot of times when I would teach it, when I first began teaching, especially if, if it was a different way of thinking, I had a hard time. I really struggled. Um, and so now I, I try to, to give them the time and space to explain what they're thinking. Um, Cause I, I honestly, I was, I thought that there was only one way to multiply, you know, there's only one, you know, you, you put the two columns together and the, and you pound through the algorithm. I, I had no idea. There was no understanding in anything I did. And that, and that little video shows you that our mathematics that we do in, in the elementary classrooms on up is really built to um, conserve paper and to make, uh, to make uh, things efficiently efficient and fast, make math efficient and fast. And, and it's kind of neat now that we have all this technology, I think we have the opportunity to, to take, a, take a breath and look at math for its true meanings, you know, and, and, and see that. And that's, that's what I'm trying to convey, I guess, with that video, even though you've probably seen it a hundred times, but, but I think it's, uh, it's fascinating. And um, so let's, let's see, I, I did not, I hate going back and forth. I apologize. I'm terrible at this and I, and I'm going to have to do it all for the next two weeks. <laughs> I'm not very happy about that, but here we go. Um, so how have our classrooms and tests changed since the, since the advent of the computer? Um, and I'm not, I don't think I want to do a breakout for this one. Um, let's, cause I'm running out of time. Let's go ahead and, uh, uh, we'll come back to it. Um, cause we're going to talk about this in a minute anyway. The other, the other thing, the, the other paradigm that completely changed the way I look at t how I teach and mathematics in general is mistakes, you know, um, Mistakes grow your brain. Uh, labels like gifted hamper growth. You know, I, I was, I had a big long slide with lots of words, but I took all the words out and boiled it down to this. Um, because I think that's been my entire life. I, I think I missed out on mathematics, a lot of really fun mathematics, because I was so worried about making a mistake and I didn't learn anything. Um, I was really good at memorizing stuff, but I memorized it so I could be perfect, not, not because I, so I could learn. And, and so that's, uh, let's, let's do queue up that video, rethinking giftedness. I, I do want right, to watch that. Okay. And it should be this one. Yep. That's the one. Hi, I'm Alan. Hi, Alan. Um, tell me a bit about your experience of being labelled as smart or gifted. Yeah, I was labelled as gifted in elementary school, actually. I was tested in kindergarten, um, and some force deemed that I was worthy of some special attention. We took a weird test that was nothing like it ever done before, and then after that, some of the kids that took the test were pulled out of class to go to a special class. I grew up in Senegal, in West Africa, and uh, I, I was labeled as gifted because um, from a great standpoint, I was always in the top 5%. At first, it made me feel very validated. It, it made me feel like I was special. Being gifted to me meant that it, it just was something that was in me already. It was not something I could work at, but it was something that came from within me and had been identified by this test when I was seven. My expectation to myself was that I was supposed to always know everything and always be the top of everything because gifted people are supposed to be invincible. As someone who is a top student, um, who was smart, I needed to be doing everything all the time so there was no room for mistakes. I usually made it seem like I wasn't struggling, which resulted in me struggling more because I wouldn't ask for help. 
I wasn't supposed to ask questions because I was already supposed to know how to do everything. And people would come to me, but I couldn't go to anyone else if I needed help. I would actively like try to show people I wasn't spending much time doing work to, to make it seem like it was effortless for me. Well, the first time I really struggled with something was memorizing my times tables. And that made me feel terrible. And like my mom wouldn't talk to the teacher and like everyone was freaking out that I couldn't do something. And struggling meant that maybe it was running out. Maybe I was getting towards the end of that thing that was within me and I couldn't go any further. So it was really scary. When I had to actually learn to do something or try hard in something, I would just turn away from it completely. It's like I don't want people to find out that I'm not what they thought I was. As soon as I slipped up, as soon as I made a small mistake, the kind of feeling I came around was that I wasn't gifted. I am not a gifted individual when it comes to mathematics. I questioned very much like if I was meant to study engineering because I wasn't the best person in my math or chemistry classes. Being labeled as gifted based on my grades made grades the most valuable assets I had. And when they were not up to par, I started really doubting who I was and questioning myself. And my idea of self was really um, deflated. Being one of the few Latina students in the school, I felt this additional pressure because I was there to represent my people. I had to make this choice of being in a space where I was this gifted person, but then I couldn't be myself and like be my full self. Hi, my name is Nava and I am nine years old. How would you feel if somebody told you that you were gifted? Um, I would feel great. And how would you feel if your friends were told they were gifted but you weren't? Then I would kind of feel bad because um, they're telling all my other friends that they're gifted but not me. Uh, my name is Jude and I am 10 years old. Hi Jude. When people say that somebody's smart, what do you think that means? Well, if you say someone's smart, it's like, oh, they're smart and the other person is not. Mm, what do you think about that? I don't think that's very fair to label someone. Like, either tell everybody, oh, you're a regular kid, or tell everybody you're gifted, because saying to one kid, oh, you're a gifted kid, no, you're not, can either drop their self-esteem or have it rise really fast. If you're separating kids, one, they could work well together and they could collaborate. And two, if there's this group of kids who are supposedly not gifted, what if they are, what if they can do something amazing and help the supposedly gifted kids? I think if I grew up in a world where no one was labeled as gifted, I would have asked a lot more questions. You can try as much as you want and your brain will grow even if you get the answer fully wrong. So how did it feel to know you can learn anything? Great, because I had felt before that I could only learn like limited things, but now I kind of felt like I just wanted to grab a giant book and just read and, uh, until I learned everything I could. How do I feel knowing that I can learn anything? <laughs> Woo! Anything. Yes! Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yes! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Sweet. I'll start sharing again. Um, but yeah, I that again that video not that 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 was the only video I could find of hers that really kind of talked about mistakes and and she has some others but but it was the shortest one and and it that video resonates with me a lot I'd put it in the chat you can read that but uh um you know it, it's it changed the way I thought it, it really changed the way uh I thought about myself as as a as a human being it uh, I grew up, when I grew up, I really thought uh, my brain was just going to hit this limit and then it was, I would be done. And uh, I'd had that thought for years and it was, and it came from those, those times tables tests back when I was a kid is I just could not, my brain, it turns out is it works a little differently than most people's and it, I can't, 
Uh, I can't just regurgitate quickly things and I can't think about things quickly. <laughs> it's just not in my vocabulary and it's just my brain does not work that way. And so uh, I had to really, uh, th that video to me is kind of special in terms of that. I, it, it just highlights that uh, we have to be careful what we do with our kids um, in terms of labeling them. Because uh, sometimes, sometimes fast is not smart. Uh, uh, he, I don't know. That, that's that's my take on it. <laughs> so I know I'm running short on time, and so I do want to have a quick one last breakout session. But I'm going to start sharing. Uh, I think we're going to end with um, with my breakout. Yeah. Asking one of the last questions. This just this picture here. Um, we did the uh, solar project. I, I don't. I only do it about every couple of years because I just it's kind of when I have time at the end of the year. But it's probably one of the funnest projects the kids do because they really jump into it. But we cook a marshmallow, and we've had some kids create some pretty crazy, um, crazy, crazy uh, temperature changes with that. But anyway. I, I really think you should teach current brain science to students. Every student I teach takes the course, that U-Cube course online, every kid, and I make them journal about it. Uh, they journal about each week, um, and they don't have to journal much, they just have to, uh, so we, it's, I forget how many weeks it is off the top of my head, but, but I have them journal um, and, and just write me a little note about what their thoughts are about learning math. And so that's, that's one thing I do with them. And then I'm gonna switch focus here just to kind of show you what's on here. Um, if GeoGebra has been a big passion of mine, a couple of ways I use it in the classroom is, uh, so I have my own curriculum. It's, it's a, I, I don't like sharing it because it's, it's not real great yet, but uh, it's a work in progress, but how I kind of implement this, uh, this worksheet kind of, you can, you'll have access to it. You can click on it. But when I, I, you know, you're looking at a textbook and the kids, a lot of kids cannot see three dimensions when they look in a textbook, but uh, here they can, you know, by just, this still only took me like a couple minutes to create. And now they can tell me what skew means and parallel and, and perpendicular, and they can answer the questions and manipulate this thing um, to whatever position they need to see that it's three dimension. And I think that's mind boggling that's <laughs> that they have that, that option now. And then, you know, when I teach three equations and three unknowns, I mean, yeah, we still teach the algebra, but darn sure on almost every single one of them, I show them the geometry. You know, there's your three equations, three unknowns. And so that's in GeoGebra 3D. So, um, so these are all tools worth exploring uh, in your classroom. And, and in terms of the last thing I'll talk about here is Desmos. And I don't think I'll explore it with you yet, but if you get a chance, look now, because they have uh, math for the visually impaired. So when you hit play at the bottom of the screen, it'll, it'll go through the sound um, of, the, of the wave and things like that. And so, and uh, we'll come back to it, to another one. We'll come back to it, like as I say, a discussion at the end, but uh, I've switched, I did a lot of Khan Academy um, I've switched more to Alchemist. Um, I am going to show that what I do with Alchemist. It's in the art of problem solving. Uh, I switched it with all my kids. All my kids do Alchemist. They all, some complain about it, but I'm fisherman. <laughs> Let me get logged on here. But uh, Alchemist is one of those that the challenge them. Um, and the reason I, I'm really sold on it is I had a kid who last year I couldn't, we barely, I barely got her to pass. Barely, 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 we barely made it to the end of the year. And 
this year she's on Alchemist and she goes, Mr. Shaben, what is the exclamation point in math? She said, there's an exclamation point? <laughs> and she was horrified. But at the same time, she asked the question. And uh, so I got to talk to her about counting and fundamental counting and, and, and that kind of stuff. And the question came from her, who she was my, my she was, she hated math last year. She, she's starting to see it, see that it's a little better this year. And it's really because of, um, because of the art of problem solving. Um, let me pull up Al Alchemist. And so if you have never seen it, um, it's not as kind of robust as, as Khan Academy and some of those, but, uh, oops, I don't want to do, you hit play and you can change focus. And pretty much all my kids are in pre-algebra or algebra or geometry. I don't go into intermediate or pre-calculus unless they're a kid that really likes a challenge. Um, these are hard for me to do in these bottom two. Um, they're all challenging. That's why I like the course. But I'll just kind of just show you quick teacher tool wise um, what you can do with it. And you have to uh, contact them via email, I think, to set this up. But uh, uh, when, you, when you click on, I've set up just some courses, like here's pre-algebra. And we do about 12 questions, um, 12 questions a, uh, a week. Um, and you can see some of the kids, like Titus here, he's really going crazy in this. But the green means they passed that lesson and they're moving on. And it moves them right through it. So it'll be interesting. We got a long ways to go. It'll be interesting to see where we end up. But that just kind of shows you some of the alchemists that we do. Um, and uh, I see there's a chat. So uh, I think that's where, I think we're gonna have, I think we want one more breakout session. And uh, let's see, yeah, yeah, so uh, let's let's go ahead and do one more breakout session. Um, I know I just threw a lot of information at you all at once, uh, but here it is. What sources of problems did you see during uh, during what sources of problems did you use during quarantine? What are some tax, tasks you guys used? Are there resources you would like to share? So, go ahead and break us out. Let me stop sharing. One person, speak out in the silence. Anybody? Looks like just everybody jumped back in. So a couple of oh, people might have missed that, Dan. Yeah, if, if uh, let's have one share out of your breakouts. I'm not very good at, at the silence. <laughs> I'll share quick then. I, I really like the open middle. I, I just love those problems. I love the low floor, high ceiling. I like how they help kids understand it uh, and challenge students. And uh, so I, I love them and uh, they're, they're really keep students on the ball, but they even students that are coming in can start and, and go with them. So. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, my last couple. There's just two, two slides or so. This is a, another problem distance between two towers. If you get a chance, you can watch it. I do a problem called the box problem. Alicia Davis and I spent a lot of time working on this together. Um, still one of my favorite problems. Do it every year. Uh, but my parting comment to you is I don't know if you know much about me but I'm now a, a robotics teacher um, I think you should love your students enough to learn with them pick a topic or a subject you have always been a little scared of and learning along with them uh, when I started teaching it was logarithms because when I started I had no clue what they were I, for some reason I missed out on them uh, and I didn't have a really good sense of math understanding anyway and then after that, I, I kind of hammered out counting and, and probability and that kind of stuff. But currently I'm choosing electronics and robotics and I'm going on five years. And if you should, if you get one to kind of see what I do, get on Twitter and 
I post a lot of uh, videos of what, not what I do, because I don't do it. I, the kids do it. And they've created some amazing projects over the last five years. And, and I'm learning right along with them. I mean, they, they know, you know, they're, they're in the driver's seat. And so, and then my last comment um, is uh, the Matthew principle applies to education. To those with everything, more will be given. To those with nothing, everything will be taken away. Uh, we're in a, we are in a race to ensure that all of our students leave our classrooms with something every day. The price for them is too high if they leave with nothing. And so with that, I thank you um, for going on the journey for the last hour with me and giving up your Saturday. It was, uh, I, I got something out of it and hopefully you all did too. So um, 